On one fateful night in July of 1979, a Hells Angels hit squad quietly convened under the cover of darkness. These stone-cold killers had been stalking their target, Rolling Stone's frontman Mick Jagger for over a week now. They had first tracked down the famed British rocker while he was staying at the home of artist Andy Warhol. The Angels had performed reconnaissance outside Warhol's luxurious estate in the Hamptons and had discovered that it was patrolled by armed guards day and night. Not willing to launch a frontal assault against a position that was guarded by men carrying automatic rifles, the Angels called off the operation and decided to bide their time and wait. Jagger had his own home in the Hamptons, and while scouting out this location, the Angels came up with an ingenious idea. Instead of blasting their way in through the front door as they had planned to do at Warhol's house, this time, they would take a much more clandestine approach. The plan was to completely bypass security by sailing across the Long Island Sound and into the backyard of Jagger's estate. They would then quietly plant explosives under the rock legend's home before sailing back into the night. But just why were the Hells Angels so intent on murdering one of the most famous musicians of all time? To understand that we must go back all the way to 1969. On December 6th of that year, a massive, free concert was set to take place at the Altamont Speedway, a racetrack that's about an hour away from San Francisco. While the concert was conceived as a celebration of the 1960s counterculture and its ideals of peace and love, due to astonishingly poor planning, the event turned into an absolute disaster that led to four deaths, and it would go down as one of the most controversial moments in music history. In November of 1969, the Rolling Stones were one of the most popular bands in the world and were in the middle of their first American concert tour in almost five years. While the tour was incredibly successful, the band faced sharp criticism from the media due to their high ticket prices, with famed music critic Ralph Gleason writing in the San Francisco Chronicle, quote, paying five, six, and seven dollars for a Stones concert at the Oakland Coliseum for, say, an hour of the Stones seen a quarter of a mile away because the artists demand such outrageous fees that they can only be obtained under these circumstances, says a very bad thing to me about the artist's attitude towards the public. It says they despise their own audience. In response to this, the Stones decided to prove the critics wrong by ending their tour with a massive free concert in California that would also include other popular artists such as Jefferson Airplane, Santana, and The Grateful Dead. The concert organizers had been inspired by the Woodstock Music Festival, which had taken place four months earlier in New York. Woodstock turned into a worldwide phenomenon and became a seminal moment in music history. It was hoped that the California concert would achieve a similar level of success and be recognized as a sort of Woodstock on the West Coast. While tickets would be free, the Stones had a financial interest in the concert being as large as possible, as their US tour was being filmed for a documentary called Gimme Shelter that would later be released in theaters, and the band had negotiated a deal where they would receive 50% of the film's profits. The show was scheduled for December 6th, but was plagued from the beginning by poor planning. Originally set to take place on the grounds of San Jose State University, a previous concert held a couple of weeks beforehand had drawn a crowd of over 80,000, who had left a trail of destruction in their wake, leading city officials to have no interest in another large concert occurring, and so their permit applications were rejected. Organizers then looked at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, but again they were rejected due to the city's mayor having a strong dislike of hippies and the counterculture movement. With the concert scheduled to take place within days, the organizers were starting to become desperate, but at the last minute, they managed to book the Sears Point Raceway near the city of Sonoma in Northern California. Work then began immediately on building the facilities and laying the infrastructure that would be necessary for an event that was expected to draw hundreds of thousands of spectators. Seeing the precarious spot the concert organizers were in, and still upset about a show the Stones had cancelled some months beforehand at another venue they ran, the owners of Sears Point demanded a $100,000 cash deposit, as well as sole distribution rights to the documentary the Stones were filming. The Stones rejected this, and so the venue would have to be changed again for a third time. On the night of Thursday, December 4th, the site of the concert was switched to the Altamont Speedway. Because the event was set to take place just two days later, on Saturday there was no time for the organizers to ensure that the concert had proper restrooms, medical facilities, parking, or, most importantly, security. Whose idea it was to hire the Hells Angels to police the event is not exactly known and is still considered a controversial question to this day, 
but the most commonly accepted story is that the angels were hired based off the recommendations of Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead, who had both previously used the angels for security at their concerts in the past without incident. The management for the Stones and the Grateful Dead then met with members of the San Francisco chapter of the Hells Angels, where a deal was made for the angels to provide security at the concert. It is important to note that this timeline of events and the individuals involved is still in dispute. The only part of the story that everyone agrees to be true is that the angels were hired to attend the concert in exchange for $500 worth of beer, which is the equivalent of over $4,000 of beer in 2023. Expectations were that 100,000 people would attend the event, but on the day of the concert there were well over 300,000 rowdy fans crowding the speedway. With the preparations for the event being done at the absolute last minute, there was no food or water for the 300,000 spectators. But this being 1969, many of the concert goers had brought their own drugs and alcohol, which they were only too happy to share. The fans weren't the only ones getting drunk and high, however, as the security guards had eagerly started drinking their $500 of beer, and by the time the concert started many of the angels had become quite drunk. The show opened up with a performance by the rock band Santana that was well received by the crowd, but as the day went on the mood turned increasingly tense as both the crowd and the angels became more and more intoxicated. It wasn't long before inebriated concertgoers tried rushing the stage, which the angels responded to by brutally beating back the crowd with pool cues and bike chains. The situation soon completely spiraled out of control, with numerous fights breaking out between members of the audience and the angels. While Jefferson Airplane was performing, the band's co-founder and lead singer Marty Balin jumped off the stage and tried to calm the situation, but he was punched in the back of the head by an angel and left unconscious. Stephen Stills, a member of the folk group Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, was also assaulted while his group were performing on stage, as an angel repeatedly stabbed him in the leg with a sharpened bike spoke. News of the mayhem soon reached the Grateful Dead, who were scheduled to perform next. Fearing for their safety, the band made the intelligent decision to leave the event immediately. This left an almost two-hour gap in the concert's schedule, where the stage was completely empty, which only further increased the aggressive actions by the belligerent audience. The angels were also growing restless, and to kill time, they began entertaining themselves by throwing full cans of beer at the heads of audience members, which caused more than one concert-goer to leave the event with a concussion. By the time the Rolling Stones arrived, the concert had devolved into complete chaos. Within seconds of stepping off their helicopter, Mick Jagger was punched in the face by an audience member. But nevertheless the show must go on, and the band made their way to the stage. Initially the appearance of the Stones calmed the crowd, but by the time they were playing their third song of the night, Sympathy for the Devil, fights had begun breaking out in the crowd once again. The band paused their song, and Jagger pleaded with the crowd to settle down. Eventually they did, and the Stones finished Sympathy for the Devil without further incident but it was during their next song when tragedy would strike. As the Stones performed Under My Thumb, an 18-year-old named Meredith Hunter was fatally stabbed to death by Hell's Angel, Alan Pizarro. Since the concert was being filmed for the documentary Gimme Shelter, the entire incident was captured on camera. Hunter had attended the concert with his girlfriend. When he told his sister about his plans, she warned him that violent racism against black Americans was still very prevalent in that area of Northern California. Hunter agreed, and to protect himself, he decided to bring a 22 caliber revolver. He initially left the gun locked in the trunk of his car, but as the mood of the concert turned increasingly violent, he decided to go back and retrieve it. His girlfriend wanted to leave, but Hunter convinced her to stay as the Rolling Stones were about to perform. 45 minutes before the killing, Hunter, who was easy to pick out from the crowd due to his lime green suit, was recorded making several attempts to rush the stage alongside several other audience members. Like many of his fellow concert attendees, Hunter was high on drugs, a fact that would later be confirmed during his autopsy. While the Stones were performing Under My Thumb, Hunter climbed on top of a speaker next to the stage to get a better view. A group of angels saw this and promptly pulled him off and punched him in the face. Hunter stood up and retreated into the crowd with the angels in hot pursuit. Hunter then pulled out the pistol from his pocket and stretched out both of his arms before Hell's Angel Alan Pissarro stabbed him twice. As Hunter fell to the ground Pissarro stabbed him four more times. As he laid on the ground bleeding, Pesaro and the other angels surrounded him and began kicking him in the head. The assault continued until Hunter stopped moving. One of the angels then picked up a metal garbage can and dropped it on Hunter's head. 
Pissarro then told a group of bystanders, quote, Don't touch him, he's gonna die anyways. In addition to Hunter, two other concert goers were killed in a hit and run, while another drowned in an irrigation ditch while they were high on LSD, bringing the total death count of the one day concert to four people. Alan Pissarro would later be arrested and charged with murder, but was acquitted after the jury saw the footage from the event. He would later drown in Anderson Lake on March 29, 1985, a death that the head of the local sheriff's detective unit would call, quote, kind of suspicious. But foul play was never confirmed. In the immediate aftermath of the concert, the blame for all of the violence was placed squarely on the Hells Angels, and the Rolling Stones vowed to never work with them again. This angered the Angels, who felt insulted that Jagger and the Stones didn't make an effort to defend them in the media. A couple of weeks after the concert, Oakland chapter president Sonny Barger, who was present at the event, called into a radio show to defend the group's actions by saying, quote, I didn't go there to police nothing, man. I ain't no cop. I ain't never pretended to be a cop. And this Mick Jagger, like, put it all on the angels, man. Like, he used us for dupes, man. And as far as I'm concerned, we were the biggest suckers for that idiot that I can ever see. And you know what? They told me if I could sit on the edge of the stage so nobody climbed over me, you know, I could drink beer until the show was over. And that's what I went there to do. Enraged that the Stones didn't publicly defend them, the Angels decided to put a contract on Mick Jagger, and over the subsequent years they made numerous attempts on the rock star's life. The first would come in 1975, when an assassin tracked Jagger down to a hotel in New York City that he was reportedly staying at. The Angel, who was carrying a silenced pistol, waited in the hotel lobby for Jagger, but fortunately, he never showed up. The next attempt on Jagger's life would be the one discussed at the beginning of the video. After their plan to get Jagger at Andy Warhol's house was called off, the Angels then loaded a small boat with explosives and quietly sailed across the Long Island Sound, intent on blowing up Jagger's house for the perceived disrespect that he had shown them. However, the plan turned into a complete disaster, because just as the Angels were halfway through their journey, a storm rolled in that was so strong it capsized their boat, causing the would-be assassins to be dumped into the water and lose their explosives at the bottom of the sea. This plot would remain a secret for decades until 1983, when a former Hells Angel, known only by the alias Butch, testified before a United States Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that was investigating the links between motorcycle gangs and the Mafia. Butch claimed that he had attended numerous meetings where plots to kill Jagger were discussed, and that the Angels felt that the band had worked to turn public opinion against them in the aftermath of the Altamont concert. Butch also said that the contract was still open, and even though the first three attempts had ended in failure, he predicted that eventually they'd be successful, saying that whoever does it, well, it will be quite a trophy. Whether the Angels ever made another attempt on Jagger's life is an open question. But if they did, we know for a fact that it ended in a resounding failure, as Mick Jagger is still alive and well at the ripe age of 80. He's in such good health in fact, that he and the rest of the octogenarian Rolling Stones are going on tour next April a tour that is fittingly sponsored by AARP, aka the American Association of Retired Persons. And that was the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.